This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. Matthew 18 in your Bibles this morning, Matthew chapter 18. We'll pick up where we have left off with Peter in our series interviews with men worth imitating. And uh, it's been a while since I said this, so it's probably worth time to say it again. We, in scripture, we have this word mimetes, which means to imitate, and it's always used positively. And we're told to imitate Christ, imitate God, and we're told to imitate those who are who are following God and who are living a life of faith. Uh, so we've called this interviews with men worth in, imitating because we are looking at various characters in scripture who have had their faults, but have had that, their successes. And as we walk through their life, we interview each person as best we can. Mind you, they are dead people, so bummer we can't do a live interview. But um, one day we might do that in heaven. So... Um, this series could be continued up there, but by that point, you could do your own interview. We are on Matthew chapter 18, uh, verses 21 to 35 will be our text for today. And uh, we will pick up where we left off with Peter. Matthew 18, 21 through 35. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Verse 23, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven like unto a certain king, which would take accounts, account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife, and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out, and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him an hundred pence, and he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and came and told their Lord all that was done. Then the Lord, after he had called them, said, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, verse 32, Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou have also had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespass. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this text of Scripture. And Lord, today as we look at this text through the eyes of Peter, who asked the question, I ask that you would Teach us lessons of forgiveness today that we need. Open our hearts and minds to what your spirit has to do within us today. Lord, would you give each of us just a, a snippet or a nugget of truth that we can take home and live out this week. 
Lord, you know exactly what the needs are. And we're expecting you to meet each need today. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. At this point in our life of Peter, we've seen Peter, uh, he has followed Christ. He has seen his mother-in-law healed. He saw the miraculous draught of fish. Uh, He has heard the Sermon on the Mount. He's seen Jairus' daughter raised from the dead. He's been out there walking on the water, uh, as only Christ could do, and Christ and Peter are the only two in the world to walk on water. He's made this big theological confession of who Christ is. Uh, He was there on the Mount of Transfiguration when Christ was glorified in front of him. And last time we we were here with Peter, he uh, went to pay taxes by going fishing and got a coin out of the fish's mouth. So let's start our interview today and and pick up where we've left off and ask Peter about this text where he asked the Lord about forgiveness. Peter, I understand that not long after your fishy way of paying taxes, uh, that Jesus taught you some important lessons on forgiveness. Yes, he did. Matthew 18 records some of these and Um, At the beginning of the chapter, he had taught us that greatness begins with humility and that we needed to be like a child. And he would also taught us to avoid sin and we were warned about causing other people to sin and stumble into sin, especially someone who is weak or or a new believer. But then the question gets raised of what about when someone sins against me? And that was the lesson Christ was going to teach us. Uh, So Peter... Christ anticipated that you would be sinned against. How did, and, and, and he wanted to teach you how to respond? Yes, Christ wanted to teach us how to respond, um, but it was still evident that I hadn't learned the first two lessons. What do you mean, Peter? What do you mean you hadn't learned the first two lessons? Well, I hadn't learned humility. Look at the way I phrased the question. Verse 21. How oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? I lacked humility myself. I was sure that my brother would be the one sinning against me. But I wasn't so sure I would be the one sinning against my brother. My second mistake was that I wanted to put limits and measures on the love of God. I didn't understand that the love of God was about a relationship. It was, it was not about a legalistic legislation, but it was a relationship with the Heavenly Father. And if you look in this chapter that Matt, where Matthew recorded it, four times in this passage it mentions Heavenly Father. Christ is emphasizing our relationship with Him. It's, it's a family relationship, not just a judicial relationship. And I didn't understand the depth of the love of the Father. didn't understand the depth of the love of Christ. Paul wrote about it in Ephesians. He said, In Ephesians 3.18, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ with which passeth all knowledge, that she might be filled with the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, excuse me, throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. I tell you, I was still growing in the school of Christ. I had been with Christ for some time. I knew that I needed to forgive, but I was still growing in my understanding of really what, what is forgiveness? What is living godly like? I mean, at this point, we'd already listened to the Sermon on the Mount, and Christ completely blew out of the water the Pharisees' teaching He was calling for something much higher than their rules and regulations. He was calling for a spirit of the law, a spirit that wanted to obey Christ, and I still wasn't getting it. Uh, Peter, what made this so clear to you that you didn't grasp the teachings uh, of Christ? uh, You didn't grasp what Christ was saying on on forgiveness? Well, like I already said, I I wasn't humble yet. Uh, but I, I realized it was right to forgive people. I, I also realized I had an obligation to forgive. But I thought there would be limits on this. I mean, surely there's limits. Surely if maybe it's a deliberate sin, I, I can ignore it. Or, or maybe if they do it so many times, I can ignore it. Um, I didn't fully understand the extent of forgiveness. 
Peter, I, I wonder if how many of us even try to forgive. Uh, can you think of anyone this week or this month who you've consciously had to forgive for something they did? Or maybe it's the same offense seven or eight, nine times. Peter had only been in the school of Christ for three years at this point, and he had a great deal to learn. But some of us have barely matriculated into that school and are far from graduating, and we've been walking with Christ for much longer. Um, Peter at least had a heart here to forgive. So Peter, let me move on. Why did you think there would be limits on forgiveness? I mean, after what Christ had been teaching, after the Sermon on the Mount, what, what was in your mind of why you thought forgiveness was limited? Well, the rabbis in my day taught that you forgive someone three times, and the fourth offense, you don't. Um, so you, you don't forgive beyond four times. Uh, Rabbi ben jo, uh, or Josie ben Judah said, If a brother sins against you once, forgive him. A second time, forgive him. A third time, forgive him. But a fourth time, do not forgive him. He wrote that in about 180 AD, 180 years after Christ. So Peter, was this the only teaching that the rabbis taught? Was this the only thing that you were learning? No, before my days of walking with Christ, uh, that is what infiltrated my mind, is what they taught. But you know, that was the predominant thought of the rabbis of Christ's day, but it wasn't always the thought of the rabbis. You see, about a hundred years before Christ, 109 to 107 BC, there were there was a Jewish writing called the Twelve Testaments or the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, and in that writing, uh, in the Testament of Gad, he said, "And if he be shameless and persist in wrongdoing, even so forgive him from the heart and leave to God the avenging." So Christ's teaching on forgiveness wasn't new. No, Christ's teaching on forgiveness was rooted in the Old Testament. It was rooted, um, and, and it was there 100 years before Christ. However, the, the concept of forgiving, you see, the, the Pharisees and rad, rabbis of the day, of Christ's day, they were teaching that three times is enough and you can forgive. They had a few obscure passages that they liked to point to. But I'll tell you what, that was a fleshly approach to the problem. Honestly, who wants to forgive someone after they've done the same thing three times? Who wants to forgive someone after they have offended you in the same way, at the same time, and, and you, you've informed them, when they keep offending you, who wants to forgive? So we had latched on as, as a Jewish people, as Jewish teaching, we'd latched on to that concept, and we didn't like the idea of unconditional forgiveness. In contrast to the teaching of the Pharisees, I thought I was being extra spiritual. They taught that if you forgive three times, that's enough. Man, I did it to seven. I kind of figured that, you know, it's double what they say to forgive, plus one. And seven was the number of perfection, closely linked to the idea of the covenant with God and to forgiveness. So I thought I was being extra spiritual. And even seven, you know, let me jump in as pastor and interrupt you, Peter. It may not be that Peter actually thought seven as a number, as much as he thought that seven represent perfection. And he's really saying, Christ, do you expect me to perfectly forgive everyone? Um, there's a little debate on that. I'll leave that for the scholars and the commentaries. Um, but Peter did think he was being extra spiritual. He thought that by offering forgiveness seven times, uh, it was enough. But he didn't understand that Jesus puts no limit on forgiveness. And true forgiveness comes from a heart. And love keeps no record of wrong. Back to you, Peter. Well, it's clear I did not fully understand the love of God. Paul wrote about the love of that we as believers should have for each other in 1 Corinthians 13. He said, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth, or 
sorry, I lost my spot. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. I did not yet understand the love that God was, was working in my heart. The love that God had for us is the same love that I owe everyone else. I wasn't to keep score. I wasn't to keep accounts. I was to endure all things. Well, Peter, how did Christ respond to your, your, your question here? What was his answer? Well, his answer was simple at first, and then it, it kind of mushroomed out. He said, uh, Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Now we're not sure linguistically, as I jump in here as pastor, if, if it means seventy times seven or if it means seventy-seven. Um, guys will debate on, on some of the grammar there. But it's possible that this Christ is hearkening back to Genesis 4. If you remember in Genesis 4, Cain has, um, or, or Lamech has, has had someone kill, or I'm messing up the story. Let me just read the verse. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. Lamech here is the first um, polygamist in the Bible. Um, he kills a young man to his wounding, and he comes home, and he's kind of bragging about it, and he's saying, look, if Cain was avenged sevenfold, then me seven, seventy and sevenfold. And so it, it seems as if Christ here is contrasting the revenge of and the vengeance that, that Lamech is putting out here uh, to the forgiveness that we ought to have. Uh, one commentary put it this way, he said, it's possible that the evangelist, Matthew, is thinking of Genesis, 20, or Genesis 4, 24. Otherwise, there's no explanation for the unusual formulation of the number 77. If there is an issue, if the issue was limiting the revenge that hangs over the bloody deeds of the descendants of Cain and Lamech, here it is an abol abolition of revenge altogether. In effect, the church Jesus ruled was of radical forgiveness. With Christ, there is no limit to forgiveness. And that's what Peter was learning. So Peter, tell us what, what then mushroomed about this answer, because you're to forgive. Well, Christ tells us a story. As he often did when he wanted to illustrate a truth, he would tell us a story. And in this story, the king had his, his servants, his subjects, and it was time for them to come settle accounts. Now, it was not uncommon for kings to have ambassadors and various servants of theirs all over dealing with money, whether tax collecting or, or other uh, needs of the kingdom. And it was time to settle accounts. And the, the servant had come and he had an impossible debt. A debt he couldn't pay. To, to put it in perspective, his debt was 10,000 talents. Now $10,000 wouldn't be that much, but a talent was the largest form or denomination of money of that day. Whether it was gold or silver. And a talent was the equivalent... Of, or, I'm sorry, his debt was the equivalent of 200,000 man years of labor. 200,000 years of working. That is the amount of debt this man owed. It would be in the billions and billions of dollars today. Now, how this guy racked up the debt, it, we're not told. And we would almost expect to hear about other servants coming in and them giving their account. But the story just moves on from this one servant. And when the servant is going to be thrown into prison and his wife and children sold, which clearly shows this was not a Jewish king, but a, a Gentile perception because the Jews were not allowed to, allowed to sell the wife and children. So his wife and kids and everything he had was going to be sold to at least recoup some of the losses and the man falls on his face and he begs with the king. He says, please don't, 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 please. I will pay you all. Verse 26. Now there is no way he could pay all. 
often in that day they would throw you in the debtor's prison and then they would torment you. And so the, the idea was to get out of your debtor's prison, your family and friends and the people who felt sorry for you would bring money and do everything they could to pay off your debt to get you out of torture. This was not a Jewish practice, but it, it was a practice in the ancient world. And so this man pleads with the king not to go to prison, not to... And the king has mercy on him. And the king forgives his debt. He doesn't just say, okay, I'll let you free and I'll let you go pay back your debt. He completely wipes the debt clean and cancels it. And that servant goes out and finds another servant that has a small debt. A debt, uh, in the text, it's, it, what is it, a hundred denarii? A hundred pence. A pence is a denarii. Uh, that is the equivalent of about a third to two-thirds of a year labor. So you're dealing with, you know, what you could pay off feasibly within a year. And he, he takes this man by the neck, drags him to prison, won't have any mercy on the man. Now this is a small debt, a debt that could be forgiven, a debt that could be paid back, a debt that, you know, in the scope of things, is, is, it's, less than, it's less than half a percent of this other guy's debt. And he refuses mercy and throws him into prison. But there were other servants who watched what had happened, and they told the king. And when the king found out about it, he wasn't so happy. He calls the servant back in, the wicked servant. He rebukes him, and he, he tells him, You wicked servant! I forgave you this much, and you can't even forgive this other man. You should have, you should have forgiven and now he's renewed of his original debt. He's thrown into prison. He's tortured. And then Christ applies it. It's amazing that, you know, here a talent, just one talent was worth about 15 years of labor. And so this servant owes somewhere between 150 to 200,000 years of labor. There was no way he was going to pay it. It's quite possible here that because Christ used the largest denomination of money, a talent, and he used the largest figure they really dealt with in money, 10,000, it's possible Christ here is not emphasizing as much the numbers as he is, this is an unpayable debt. This is an infinite. This is a debt that cannot and will not be paid. Uh, it's quite possible that's what he was emphasizing and giving the listener some shock value. And the, t the settling of accounts in the story here, settling of an account is often connected with the idea of judgment. There's going to come a day at the end of the world when we are going to have our accounts settled with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And as Christ told us this story, and as we listened, we could not believe the audacity of this man who could throw his fellow servant in prison. After being forgiven so much, how could he do that? And yet, we often don't have compassion on those around us. We should show the same compassion that we have received. In this story, God is the one pictured as the king or the one in charge. He's perfect. He's never done you and I wrong once. He owes no man anything, and he's all sin that's done in this world is against him. Every sin. Let that sink in. Not just your sin, but the sin of the person next to you. The sin of everybody in this room. The sin of everybody in this town. The city of everybody in this country. The city and everybody in this world, and the sin of everybody in the world through all history has been an offense against God. Now let's put that to some numbers. Let's just say you and I, let's say we sin three times a day. Those are three sins against God. In the course of a year, I know the math's not perfect, just let me do some rounding. That's about a thousand sins a year. And some of you, we have various ages in here from below 20 to um, upwards of 70 and 80. So let's just say 50. Okay, let's just take an easy number, 50. <laughs> let's not talk about age, all right? 
So at a thousand sins a year for 50 years of your life, you've committed approximately 50,000 sins. 50,000 sins. And there's about 20 of us in the room. Who wears my mathematicians? <laughs> That's just in this room. Now, how many of those 50,000 sins were against your neighbor? 10? 20? Let's be generous and say 100. That's not much compared to all of those sins against God. And that's just within this room. I wonder if we could even put a number on the amount of sins committed against God. And in contrast to God, every one of us is a sinner. Every one of us owes everything to God. And every one of us is consistently doing wrong to God, to our neighbor. And we have a few sins against us. Your neighbor may have sinned against you 50, 100 times. That's a drop in the bucket compared to what you've done and compared to what all the sin against God. And God has forgiven us unlimitless. He has forgiven us completely. And we won't forgive another person. The God of the universe who's had millions and billions and probably trillions of sins against him and has forgiven. And we've had someone who rubs us wrong the wrong way two or three times. Paul said later in his epistles, let all bitterness and anger, or bitterness and wrath and anger, clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another. And get this, we're to be kind and tender hearted and forgiving. Why? Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. This servant was forgiven by the king, and he wouldn't forgive. God has forgiven you and he has forgiven me. We have no right to hold someone else's sin against them. In fact, the sin, the debt that they owe us, think about it this way. The wicked servant, I'm just going to throw out a number. Let's, let's say it was 15 bucks that he was owed by this, the lower level servant. The wicked servant is trying to get his 15 bucks. Well, the king, the wicked servant owes the king money. So the money that this servant over here owes to the wicked servant really belongs to the king, does it not? Servant, let's call him servant number two. <laughs> servant neutral, I guess. Uh, his money belongs to the wicked servant, which belongs to the king. Now the wicked servant's been forgiven. He no longer owes that 15 bucks to the king that this guy owes him. So why is he trying to exact it? Your sin and mine were paid for on the cross. And when we try to extract some sort of payment out of someone else, we're saying what God did on the cross was not enough. They need more punishment. I need to get that revenge. In Ephesians 4.32, what we read where it says, we can do this because Christ has forgiven us. Ephesians 5.1, be therefore followers of God as dear children. We are to imitate God's forgiveness. Paul said in Colossians 3.13, Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And even without jumping to the works of Paul, I should have got the hint on the sermon, in the Sermon on the Mount within Matthew 5.7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. This servant wouldn't forgive a small debt in comparison to his own. And how many of us live with unforgiveness? Let me jump in as pastor a little bit here and talk about verse 35. It is a, it's an interesting verse and it can be confusing. Matthew 18.35 says, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from the heart forgive not every one, his brother their trespasses. Some have confused this verse and thought that it taught that, well, since God will not forgive me if I don't forgive my brother, then I 
can lose my salvation. Let me take you back to the text here. Notice the servant's response. In verse 26, the wicked servant falls down, worships, and says, Lord, have patience with me. I will pay thee all. He still had the thought in his mind that he was going to somehow pay this back when it was impossible. And if you notice, the king is wroth with him. Uh, I'm looking for the verse. Uh, verse 32, Then his lord, after that he had called him, said, O thou wicked service, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I have had pity on thee? And his lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due him. The king here recognizes that although this man was forgiven, he had not had a change of heart. He was the kid who got caught getting the cookies out of the cookie jar. But he wasn't sorry that he did wrong. He was sorry he got caught. There was no change in heart in this wicked servant. Oh yes, he went from being sad to happy, but he still had a wicked heart. And here in the context of Matthew 18, where Christ is dealing with more family matters, not being willing for, to forgive may be a reason you should question, am I letting Christ rule and reign in my heart? It doesn't mean we lose our salvation if there's someone you haven't forgiven. It doesn't mean you've lost your salvation. Ephesians 4.30 says we're sealed to the day of redemption. But what it does mean is we lose fellowship with the Father. In the Lord's Prayer, we have that, you know, Lord, forgive us as we forgive. I can't even quote the Lord's Prayer. I'm too tired today. So, uh, Lord, forgive us. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those that sin against us. We need to be constantly forgiving others so we can stay in a right relationship with the Father. If we violate this principle of forgiveness... We don't lose our, our relationship with God. Let me be clear. I, I'm going to interchange these words. So if you're going to catch it right, I'm going to try to say it right right now. We don't lose our relationship as children of God, but we do lose our fellowship. There's something between us and the Father. something blocking that relationship from, from growing and developing. So we haven't really lost. We're no longer out of the family. We're not out of the family, but we're out of fellowship. Like a child who wanders from home. They're not out from the family. But they may not want to call and talk to mom and dad. And they miss out on that fellowship. And God may turn and deal with us in a severe manner. This passage does say in verse 34, he was delivered to the tormentors. You know, it's interesting when Paul talks about church discipline in Corinthians, he uses the phrase, deliver them over to Satan. So someone who's not doing right and not willing to repent and not willing to get right with God and get right with those around them, the church delivers them over to Satan. I think he'd be a pretty good tormentor, don't you? And if we won't forgive other people, God lets us, even as his children, be tormented by that. It may come to the form of ulcers because you're worrying so much. Uh, Hebrews tells us, the writer there says that, that bitterness in our life, it, the, Hebrews chapter 10, let me just turn there. There are days when my mind is here and there are days when my mind is not. And today is one of those days when I can't get my mind in gear. So, I'm sorry, but we will... We'll jump right to the Bible here. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10. If I can find it. I'm looking, oh, I'm sorry. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. We'll start with verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail 
the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. When we refuse to forgive, we are saying, there is a God in heaven who is not being good to me. He's not working all things out together for good. He's not... He doesn't have my good in his interest. And we become bitter. The antithesis or the opposite of forgiveness is to become bitter. And the fruit of that is, you know, the bitterness springs up and troubles you. And it troubles many around you. Many are defiled. And then verse 16 gives two outcomes of this. And it uses the word or. Either you become a profane person or a God hater or you become a fornicator involved in all sorts of sexual sin. Now, when we choose not to forgive, God, God delivers us to the tormentors. And we're going to defile ourselves, we're going to defile many that's around us, and we're going to start reaping and sowing things we don't want to be reaping and sowing. So let me encourage you that, you know, this is not saying you can lose your salvation. Uh, what you could not gain with your own merit, you cannot lose from your own failure. Okay, So if you couldn't earn your way to heaven and you couldn't earn salvation, then there's no way you can lose it because you couldn't earn it in the first place. But God wants to work in your heart the attitude of forgiveness that the king had. God has, has forgiven you and he has forgiven me an infinite debt. Why infinite? Because it's an infinite God. When we have sinned against a perfect, holy, righteous God, we have an infinite debt against Him. We have been forgiven. We have no reason to hold anything against anyone. Now, let me be clear. Forgiveness is not passivity. In fact, look at Matthew 18, verse 15. Matthew 18, verse 15 says, Moreover, if thy brother trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Forgiveness is not ignoring the issue and pretending it didn't happen. There can still be the confrontation. There can still be the trying to restore and get things right. But it doesn't mean when they won't get things right, you hold it against them for the rest of their life. Bitterness is like drinking a poison and hoping the other person dies. Forgiveness is, is also not just a feeling. It isn't some sort of a feeling you float into. It's a choice that you make. Uh, C.S. Lewis said, and this is a great quote, Everyone says forgiveness is a lofty idea until they have someone or something to forgive. Until you've been done wrong. And I've, I've heard people say, look, I, I can forgive everybody for everything, but when it's deliberate, I can't. Or when it's done to a child, I can't forgive. Or when it's, it's done to my kid. Or when it's this is this circumstances or that. Is that what Christ taught? Put that sin, whether it's done to a child, whether it was deliberate, whatever it be, put that in perspective of God who's forgiven, the, forgiven you for everything. The God who has made it, it possible and he has forgiven the world of their sin debt. And if they will, by faith in Christ alone, accept Jesus as their Savior, they're forgiven. Well, they may reject that, but they are forgiven. The God who's forgiven everything compared to you and one or two instances? Forgiveness is needed by everybody at some point. We've all been in the place where we've done somebody wrong and we know it. And we may not be sleeping well at night. We may not we may have kind of an upset stomach, kind of knots in our stomach because of what we did. And we don't want to deal with it, but we want to go get things right. And Boy, you really hope the person you've offended will forgive you. You really hope they'll let you make things right. You and I are mortals. We're sinners. And when we sin one against another, we better forgive one another because guess what? If I sin against you today and you forgive me, you'll probably sin against me tomorrow and I need to forgive you. God's never, been, God's never sinned against any of us. 
but He has forgiven us. And there's going to come a time in our lives when each of us are going to need that forgiveness. And forgiveness is letting go of the sin so you can hold the Father's hand. Christians must be limitless in forgiving others since God has been infinitely forgiving with them. Let me be clear. Forgiveness is not necessarily forgetting. There are consequences of sin. All right? When, when a young lady has relations outside of marriage, has, is forced to drop out of high school, and has a baby, when she asks for forgiveness, and she gets forgiveness from her parents, and she gets forgiveness from God, and she gets things right, does the baby disappear? No. Does that mean she's not forgiven? No. But there's consequences. When we do things that are wrong, I mean, think about the prodigal son. The prodigal son, when he came back to the father, he was forgiven. And they rejoiced that he had come home. But the inheritance... Where did the rest of the inheritance go? Didn't go to him. He already had his inheritance. Now his relationship and his fellowship with his father had been restored. But the inheritance was gone. What was left of the inheritance went to his brother who wasn't so happy. You see... Just because we're, we, can't, we can't run out, and as Paul talks about in Romans 6, we don't run out and sin so we can be forgiven. But rather, we do our best not to. We walk in the Spirit so we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. But when we do sin, there's consequences for our sin. Every time we blow it with our husband or wife, there's consequences for that. Probably where most bitterness and unforgiveness takes place is within the home. She just can't put the towels where they belong. He just can't pick up his towel. He just can't do this. He can't, she can't do that. And we get bitter over these little things and the home becomes a minefield. You know what I'm saying? Where there's this topic, we don't go there. It's a minefield. Put a sign up, minefield. Don't go there. There's this topic. Don't go there. Till eventually, in the course of a marriage, what happens is we've minefield ourselves in. We've got barbed wire fences everywhere with signs that say, don't touch that topic, don't do this, don't do that, to where we get isolated to our own little bubble, and we say, this marriage isn't working. Divorce, next marriage. And the more we learn of the next person, we do the same thing. We minefield off this section and that section because we don't deal with things and forgive. And remember, forgiveness is not passivity. In a marriage, there's times to go to your spouse and say, hey, this, isn't, this is bothering me. or this, this, Am I bothering you on this? Or, and to get things resolved. But as believers, we should never hold bitterness. We should always be ready to forgive. So Peter, today, as we've kind of looked at this passage, and I've done a lot of talking here at the end, what did you learn out of this story? Well, to be quite frank, I learned that whenever somebody sins against me, I need to forgive. I'm going to sin against them. I'm going to need their forgiveness. But in, in the scope of everything God has done for me, I have no reason not to forgive. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the day you've given us. And Lord, today, as we've looked into this passage on, on forgiveness and your teaching there, Lord, would we not be like the wicked servant who could be forgiven so much and yet could forgive so little? Lord, would we have hearts ready and able to forgive. Lord, don't let us lose sight of our sin against you. It's easy for us to think ourselves better, to think ourselves as um, men or women who are doing pretty good on the journey of life. 
and to forget how often we sin against you. And if you can forgive us as you promised you would, then we can forgive those who sin against us. Lord, I do ask that no bitterness would spring up within our hearts. Would we not experience the fruit of that where we become profane or we become fornicators? Lord, help us not to fail the grace of God, as you said in Hebrews 12, but rather to access it. Lord, for every situation, you provide a grace to help in time of need. And we can, by faith, accept that. Lord, we need your working in our hearts, in our lives. We need you to give us a heart that is willing and ready to forgive. We recognize at times when we, we forgive, we may not feel the forgiveness. Lord, help us to make that choice to forgive. Heads bowed and eyes closed. No one's looking around. I'm just going to ask a couple simple questions. Is there someone that you have not forgiven? doesn't matter if they're a believer or non-believer. Is there someone you're holding a grudge against? I see that hand. You, yeah, you can slip a hand up if, if I see that. Put those. Can you really hold something against them when God has forgiven you? I don't. Don't be mistaken. You may ask for forgiveness from that person. And they may not respond well. Such is the story of Brother Andrew when he found out after years of smuggling Bibles into communist countries that some of his own fellow workers had been ratting on him to the communists and have, had told him out. And he went to their house to forgive and they would not accept the forgiveness. But it's your job to forgive. It's not your job to force them to accept forgiveness. It's your job to forgive. I'm going to let Mrs. Driscoll begin to play a hymn of invitation. And as the Lord's worked in your heart, do business with Him. If that means coming forward or sitting in your seat or whatever, you do business with Him. Let's just stay seated for this invitation today. Several have responded by raising a hand saying that there's someone you need to forgive. Let me pose this question to the rest of you. Who have you forgiven lately? I highly doubt that in the world we live, a world of, of sin and destruction and decay and all sorts of turmoil, I doubt that you can go through a week or a month of your life without somebody doing you wrong. Have you forgiven? Maybe you're doing better than most and you're like, I think it was Mary Barton, the lady who started the Red Cross. She was asked about a circumstance in her life that was just horrific. And she said, I don't remember that. The person asked and said, oh, don't you remember that was so dramatic and da da da. And her response was classic. I distinctly remember forgetting that. God throws our sins as far as the east is from the west. If we're his children, don't you think we can do the same? 
Don't you think He can work in our heart in such a way that we're willing and ready to forgive? Well, let's join together on number 208. Now you can stand together with me. We'll sing Grace Greater Than Our Sin. I hope the Lord's done a work in your heart. Uh, it's a lesson we all need, and it's very practical, especially within our own personal families and relationships. We better be ready and willing to forgive, and quick to forgive, so that we deliberately forget those faults against us. Number 208, join with me as we sing Grace Greater Than All Our Sin. This week you may need to access some of that grace just so you can forgive, but that's what it's there for. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the day you've given us. Thank you for this lesson from T. Peter with his question to you of how often to forgive. Lord, would you help us to forgive? Lord, show us the areas where we, th- we thought we have forgiven, but we haven't. Or we've just we're letting something fester. Lord, will we be a people who there's no handles on us because we forgive everyone, and we we are free to walk with you, to hold the Father's hand as we go through this life, because we're not concerned of holding the neck of someone who's offended us. We ask that you um, bless us as we depart and bring us back again. Um, your people in your son's name. Amen.